Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. You would think that if you were the son of a man who would end up writing over a hundred books, that you would find it hard to put your foot in your mouth. But such is not the case. I will not soon forget uh, the excitement I felt when I was first asked if I would be willing to perform a marriage ceremony and connected to that if I would be willing to do premarital counseling. I had just started serving as a pastor of a church plant and there was a young uh, couple that were dating in that church and they got engaged and they asked if I would do that for them. And I was so excited that I happened to be talking with my mother and told her all about it. Oh, it's so great. This couple asked me and I'm going to do premarital counseling with them. And I can't wait. And I'm going to use, and then I mentioned a book that I was really eager to use for that premarital counseling. And my mother was very happy for me. And eventually we got off the phone. And as soon as I hung up, it dawned on me, you know, <laughs> Among those 100 books that my father has written, there is a marriage book. He wrote The Intimate Marriage. It's one of his first books. One of his first 10 books was a book called The Intimate Marriage. And I didn't even think about using it. And then I go and boast to my mom about somebody else's book that I'm going to use. Well, I mention all that today, not because I want to talk about my father's book, The Intimate Marriage, but because I want to talk about my father's book, the consequences of ideas. And in a similar fashion, uh, I have probably made this same mistake with respect to this podcast. That is, I'm pretty sure that sometime back I did a uh, curating your book library segment encouraging you all to get a copy of Thales to Dewey by the late, great Gordon Clark. Gordon Clark was, in my judgment, also in my father's judgment, the preeminent Christian philosopher of the 20th century. And his book, Thales to Dewey, is a, a typical, comprehensive history of philosophy book, though written from a straightforward and clear Christian perspective. And it's outstanding. And again, I know that it's outstanding because I read it at my dad's insistence, and I read it at my dad's insistence while a student of my dad's taking an introduction to philosophy class at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando. As my professor, my father said, you got to read this book by Gordon Clark, and we read it, and it was wonderful, and it was amazing, and... I'll never forget that class. I mean, this is one three-hour class in the whole of my seminary education. When I was an undergrad, I had a major in philosophy. Every philosophy class the school offered, I took. And yet this one class just completely blew me away, uh, in large part because it was the confluence of these two great bright lights, Gordon Clark and my dad. Well... The same is true of the consequences of ideas. It is a, a confluence of two great lights, Gordon Clark and my dad. I had the experience of having my dad teach what Gordon Clark wrote. You can have the experience of reading what my dad wrote that he learned from Gordon Clark. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. The consequences of ideas is a broad uh, but clear and exceedingly useful and exceedingly uh, lay-friendly history of philosophy written by my father and uh, published by Crossway Books. The Consequences of Ideas. The subtitle is Understanding the Concepts 
that shaped our world. Now, let me tell you something about this title. I'm, I, I don't recall for sure whether I had... Well, actually, I did. <laughs> uh, I had something to do with the titling of the book insofar as I had something to do with the titling of the teaching series that preceded it. Uh, that was not at all an uncommon thing when I used to work at Ligonier for us to put together a new teaching series and I would be sort of tapped to come up with the title. Well, I want to tell you the backstory on this title in case you don't know the backstory, but The Consequences of Ideas uh, is a kind of play on words by another great book that I commend to your reading called Ideas Have Consequences. That's, that book is written by Richard Weaver, uh, who was part of a long tradition of very uh, sound and helpful conservative thought coming out of the University of Chicago. And what the Ideas Have Consequences is, is a kind of uh, not an all hostile to Christianity, but a not uh, straightforwardly Christian exposition of the concept of worldview. Uh, and it's just really, really good. So we borrowed from that title, trying to communicate to potential readers, hey, uh, well, here's what it says in the back cover. If you think philosophy is irrelevant to your daily life, think again. Because again, what my father does is not only is he able to take difficult concepts, professional jargon, things that other people aren't familiar with, and explain it in a way that is understandable, but he's able to do that and also at the same time demonstrate the applicability of what it is he's just taught. This is not something that you should read if you want to be a philosopher. This is something you should read because you are a philosopher. In fact, if I were to go back in time and have opportunity to uh, contribute to the title of this book again, I think I would probably title it Everyone's a Philosopher, uh, playing off of my father's book Everyone's a Theologian. Uh, this is thing. These are issues and thoughts that shape who we are and what we are. Now, you, you may remember that the last uh, six or so months uh, of, of my life, I've been privileged to teach uh, first an intro to philosophy and then an intro to ethics class at a local community college here. And to introduce so many of these concepts to students whose lives are shaped by pop culture whose ideas are formed by people they don't even know the first thing about. And part of my calling, a part of my job is to, is to help liberate these people from these forces that they don't understand. And that's what can happen for any of us. The idea here is not to seduce you into embracing secular uh, philosophy. The idea is to show you what it looks like so you can recognize it in yourself so you can see the ground that the devil has seized in your mind and in your heart so that you can push back and tear down these thoughts that exalt themselves against the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. You don't have to become a pointy headed philosophy professor to benefit from this book. It will help you follow Jesus more faithfully. And that's a good reason to read any book and a great reason to read The Consequences of Ideas by R.C. Sproul. We have made it through the first 26 questions of the Westminster Shorter Catechism and just recently completed uh, their very brief unpacking of Jesus fulfilling the munis triplex, the threefold office of Christ, looking at him as a prophet and a priest and a king. Well, before the divines move on or move out of uh, the person and work of Christ, uh, they take another look, uh, comparing and contrasting uh, two different uh, experiences in the work of Jesus. Uh, the first one coming to us now in question 27, which asks this specifically, wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Uh, 
in the Westminster Divines answer, Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born, and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. Once again, kudos and high praise to these great men of God for being able to pack so much powerful, life-changing information into so few words. This is something uh, we tend to sort of give our attention to in the context uh, of uh, Advent season more than anything else, because we are... uh, given the powerful picture of uh, Joseph and Mary being unable to find room in the inn, Joseph and Mary being sent to that place where the animals are kept, uh, the relative uh, silence uh, apart from the angelic host appearing to the shepherds, that this great world-changing spectacular event of the birth of God in the flesh, of Emmanuel, God with us, Uh, didn't come with attendant fireworks and pomp and circumstance. Well, that's true. But it's also true that that humiliation continued from that moment at least until the death of Jesus. We need to remember that the whole of his earthly life was in some sense Uh, a bringing low. Those of you who've been listening faithfully will remember, though none of you bothered to comment uh, one way or another, you remember the the segment of proper theology we did in which I read to you from my manuscript on the unholiness of God, which is really devoted to God's imminence, his closeness to us. And we get a, a good, strong dose of the imminence of God in the incarnation, but we can again lose sight of the loss inherent in it. Now, I want you to remember this. I don't want you to lose sight of the immutability of God, including God the Son. God the Son does not change in his being. That Jesus did not have omniscience and omnipotence and Uh, glory and and splendor and beauty and then lose it in the context of the incarnation and then get it back in the context of the ascension. Rather, what happened is all of this glory of his deity was veiled. It was hidden. One of the beauteous, uh, most beautiful things about the uh, uh, transfiguration of Christ is that it looks as though Uh, that veil is sort of pulled aside and we're able to behold something of his glory, if only for a moment, which brings me to my next point. Not only do we need to remember that God the Son did not lose any glory, uh, but rather the glory was only veiled, we also need uh, to at least uh, quibble a little bit about where this line is drawn between humiliation and exaltation. Uh, There's a a lot uh, in the words of Jesus himself that connects uh, humiliation and exaltation. When he tells us not to clamor for the most important seat, but to take the least seat, and then we get lifted up, uh, there's just a lot of that uh, Jesus reminding us, don't toot our own horn Let's be humble and let God lift us up. Well, uh, you can argue that, of course, that this from from incarnation onward is sort of a downward spiral of more deep uh, humiliation till we get to uh, the passion of Christ, the the torturing of him, the mocking of him, and then the crucifying of him with the the mocking, although true, sign uh, above him on that cross. But the, the, the divines say that his humiliation can, includes his being buried. Well, 
Yes, I, I, I'm not, not going to argue at all against that, but I am going to point out that maybe there's a little bit of overlap between the humiliation of Jesus and his exaltation. Jesus was born in a stable, but Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a profoundly wealthy man. This was a burial place of honor. And so one could argue that at the point of death, this is when the exaltation began. You could argue that even the the wrapping of Jesus in the linens and the giving of the perfumes and the ointments was a part of this process as well. That even before he was raised from the dead, the cycle, the downward spiral, has come to an end. You could argue that. In fact, I am arguing that. I'm not going to be upset if you don't buy it. It's okay. Uh, if you still, I mean, there's no uh, burial plot I can think of that I would be eager to get to. So I can certainly see uh, someone saying, well, no, that's not quite when it began. Uh, but it does put him in the place so that when he does come out in the context of the resurrection, the beginning of that reversal, uh, he's coming out into a place of beauty, into a garden, etc. You can take that position and I won't quibble with you. The important thing to remember is that Jesus did experience humiliation. And that humiliation was not a one-off event at his birth. It went with him everywhere that he went. Yes, we see crowds cheering for him from time to time, whether it's Palm Sunday or whether it's when he's uh, feeding the 5,000 or when it's uh, uh, doing great healings and miracles. But he was in a state of humiliation from day one. And next time, we'll look at the glory of his exaltation. Some of you may not know the backstory to one of those moments later in his life by which my father is usually rather fondly remembered. It took place at one of Ligonier's annual conferences in Orlando during a Q&A when my father, uh, in answering a question, started off reasonably gently, but eventually sort of lost his temper and growled into the microphone, what's wrong with you people? Well, you may not know the question that prompted that response, and the question was essentially this. Hey, so Adam and Eve ate the fruit that God said not to eat. Isn't God's response a little bit of an overreaction? That was the thing that really set my father off at that moment. Well, we're not going to talk about that today, but we are going to talk about a puzzler Uh, that maybe in some sense flows out of a similar spirit in many of us. And that is the question of why it is that God would determine not to allow Moses to enter into the promised land. If you recall the account in Scripture, there was a time when uh, during the Exodus, God's people were uh, feeling terribly, terribly thirsty, and they were grumbling and complaining. And uh, God spoke to Moses and told Moses, here's what I want you to do. Go out in front of the people, and there will be this rock, and I'm going to ask you to strike the rock. And when you do, water will come forth, and everyone will be satisfied. And that's precisely what Moses did following God's counsel, following God's instructions. Well, lo and behold, it wouldn't happen too much later that the children of Israel were thirsty again. And they grumbled and complained. And God spoke to Moses and said, look, I want you to go out to the rock. And when you get to the rock, I want you to speak to it. And the water will come forth. And the people will drink. And Moses went out in front of the people, stood before the rock, and struck it. And God said, no promised land for you. Well, as with 
other puzzlers. What I'm going to give you is uh, an idea, actually two ideas that might help us understand this, but uh, that are conjecture. And I recognize that and I want you to recognize that, but I do want you to consider it. Uh, two reasons. One of which is, uh, well, both of which I think really are are profoundly symbolic. Let me do the the maybe easier one first. I'm not surprised that this happened, not because, uh, well, again, let me, before I get you my two reasons, let me rem- go back to the original point. When God punishes a sin, you can never say, why is it so severe? Because every sin deserves hell. Moses wasn't kept out of the true and eternal promised land. He was kept out of the shadow promised land. He could have been kept out of the true and eternal promised land, except for the fact that Jesus died for his sins. So let's remember that none of us outside of the souls in hell have ever received worse than what we're due. And this is certainly not the case with Moses. Okay, now moving forward. Is it just possible that... One of the reasons that Moses was not allowed to get into the promised land is because Moses was would come to be so identified with the law of God. Is there a kind of meta symbolism here that's saying, hey, uh, the law is not going to get you into the promised land? Moses, the lawgiver, didn't even make it to the promised land. Moses, the lawgiver, is also Moses, the lawbreaker. You're all going to be lawbreakers, and the law is not going to get you there. That's one option. The other one's a little bit more complicated to explain, but I, I actually like it a little bit more. It's not just, hey, Moses bungled up God's instructions, and God's just really persnickety. But rather, God's instructions had a significant meaning. We know that with respect to the first striking of the rock and the water coming forth, that this was given to the children of Israel and to us as a lesson for us to recognize the work of Christ. That Jesus is himself the rock who was struck and from whom came life-giving water. So the first time when things went the way they were supposed to go, you have this beautiful picture of rescue and salvation and suffering and substitution and all of that, all there. That's great. But the second time, the symbolism is going to get changed. Why? Well, I'm going to argue on the basis of the belaboring of the point of the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus in the book of Hebrews that the reason why is very significant and simple. Because Jesus, the rock, was only struck once. And from that point forward, the way life came, which was through the rock and through the water, but it came through the proclamation of the message. Moses is not only getting all clerical, that is, acting as though the means of grace can only flow through him, that that he is essentially the means of grace, which he is doing, which is wrong, but he's also not trusting in the power of the gospel proclaimed. Do you see us in that? when we elevate rock star preachers, when we cultivate cults of personality, when we look for who we think has the anointing right now, when we come up with elaborate plans to bring people into the kingdom instead of the straightforward and plain preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only that, I would argue, and in fact have argued, that Moses is behaving like Rome. Rome, which recapitulates, I don't know what kind of the right word to do it is, I know they're very sensitive about it, but in some way the mass, what's the word? 
in the Mass, the crucifixion is happening. I think that's a safe way to say it. And through the Mass, through the the saying of the Mass, through the selling of indulgences, uh, the priest, the church, becomes the intermediary between God and man, just like Moses did when it was supposed to be the rock. That's why it was significant. Remember, if it had just been, I flubbed up the instructions, that would have been enough, not only to keep him out of the promised land, but to keep him out of heaven. We make these kinds of mistakes. And we enter into the true promised land because the father perfectly struck the perfect son once for all. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.